On March the 13th, 2023, the leaders of Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States met to announce one of the most consequential programs in the history of the Australian military. Standing before the Virginia-class submarine USS Missouri, Anthony Albanese, Joe Biden, and Rishi Sunak, the leaders of these three great maritime democracies renewed an alliance that is now over a century old. Finally, after 18 long months, the first pillar of the AUKUS Pact was revealed. The cancellation of the attack class program and Australia's decision to pursue a nuclear-powered attack submarine sent shockwaves around the world. Whether France's outrage was warranted or not, this episode led to the lowest period of Franco-Australian relations since the Vietnam War and did significant damage to Paris's relationship with both the United Kingdom and the United States. As much as the Australian strategic community welcomed the significant capability enhancement an SSN represented, the AUKUS announcement raised more questions than it answered. How is Australia going to acquire these submarines? Would they be built in Australia? Was there even enough spare industrial capacity in either the UK or the United States if an offshore construction option was selected? Which design would be chosen? Why was this a trilateral program at all? What would the fate of the Collins class be? And finally, how much is all of this going to cost? The intervening 18 months led to more speculation than solid reporting. Simply setting up a sovereign SSN construction capacity in Australia could well take a decade. As HMS Astute's 13-year development demonstrated, with a machine as complex as a nuclear submarine, it could well take an additional decade to bring the first Australian boat into service. Thus, even under favourable circumstances, any Australian manufactured SSN would probably not be operational until the mid-2040s. Not only would this fail to meaningfully mitigate the extremely severe strategic risk Australia is confronting in the 2030s, let alone the 2020s, it would leave the RAN operating the Collins-class SSGs for some 50 years. HMAS Collins was commissioned in 1996. She was originally meant to be retired in the mid-2020s. But two decades of poor political decisions by numerous Australian governments led to the Collins replacement simply being kicked down the road. Even with the attack class, which was projected to enter service in the early 2030s, the Collins would require a significant overhaul and modernization program in order to allow the class to remain operational and hopefully relevant into the 2040s. But with the cancellation of the attack class, that would now stretch almost into the 2050s. Clearly, an interim submarine capability would be required if Australia was going to transition to an SSN fleet, at least one that could be built and sustained domestically. This led to a number of proposals, many of which simply confused the public discourse. As is often the case when a major change in defence procurement is announced, different elements within the Australian strategic community took the opportunity to advance their own designs and pet proposals. Several alternatives were proposed, including the replacement of the attack class with another conventionally powered submarine. One such proposal was a development of the Collins class, colloquially called a Son of Collins, which could be manufactured in Australia. But the proposed procurement of an interim diesel-electric submarine immediately raised the question, why, then, was the attack class cancelled in the first place? After all, if Australia was going to operate a new class of conventionally powered submarine as it transitioned to an SSN fleet, then surely attack was the obvious choice. Contrary to popular belief, there is no evidence that the attack class program was cancelled due to the poor performance of the French or issues with the design itself. Although it had encountered early problems and delays, the most complex areas of intellectual property transfer had largely been addressed, and the Australian National Audit Office was generally satisfied with the program. The Australian Government and Royal Australian Navy had exhaustively examined all of the available conventional submarine options, including the development of the Collins class, and the short fin Barracuda was selected because it was the design that was most likely to meet Australia's specific requirements, especially in terms of persistence, range, and indiscretion rate. In the words of the Australian government and Australian military, the attack class was cancelled because no conventional submarine would meet the RAN's revised capability requirements. Therefore, building a new, immature, bespoke conventional submarine would necessarily mean undergoing the same design process that the attack class had just been through, meaning additional program risk, all for a submarine that would not meet the Australian military's now explicitly stated capability requirements. It seems as though some commentators were simply re-waging the battles of 2015, wishing that their pet solution had been selected over the short fin Barracuda. Consequently, given the cancellation of the attack class, if the RAN required an interim submarine solution, then a nuclear submarine was the clear and obvious choice. But which one? 
despite comments by the former Minister of Defence, Peter Dutton, that Canberra and Washington were in negotiations to purchase US-built boats, a preliminary examination of the military-industrial bases in both the United Kingdom and United States seemed to indicate that there was simply no capacity to spare. These concerns were echoed in a bipartisan letter authored by a pair of US senators, who urged the Biden administration not to place US shipyards under any additional strain, as these were already operating at full capacity just trying to meet the demands of the USN. This one letter led many to conclude that a US-built submarine was simply not an option for Australia, despite the fact that the Nuclear Submarine Task Force had not completed its investigation or delivered its findings. In terms of capability, the plan, when it was announced, was better than most observers expected. The optimal submarine pathway Prime Ministers Albanese and Sunak and President Biden announced on the 13th of March was stunningly ambitious. If realised, it would provide Australia with a globally relevant undersea warfare capability, commensurate with many of the world's major naval powers, including the United Kingdom, France, Japan and India. Indeed, only the United States, China and Russia would possess a significantly more capable attack submarine force. It is hard to overstate how significant of a capability enhancement this is for the RAN. The currently planned submarine force alone will make Australia a major naval power, one with global power projection capabilities. Truly, the SSN is the 21st century's fast battleship. Nuclear submarines are the apex predators of the world's oceans. They are the premier anti-shipping platform in contemporary naval warfare. Their combination of range, performance, stealth, situational awareness, lethality, and the ability to traverse immense distances quickly means that the RAN's SSN force will give Australia the ability to project power across ocean basins, threatening naval assets, sea lines of communication, ports, and critical enemy infrastructure at intercontinental distances. This is in addition to the threat these submarines will pose to any naval task force trying to project power against the Australian mainland. But this historic investment in Australian naval power is not being made simply to enhance Australian national prestige or Canberra's sense of its place in the world. Australia has no realistic desire to be a great power, to dominate its neighbours by force of arms, or to project its interests across the globe. It is a peaceful democracy whose primary national interests lay in nothing more than its own security and a region where large countries do not intimidate, coerce, or invade their smaller neighbours and where all Indo-Pacific powers can use the ocean to engage in mutually beneficial trade. Although, at times, it has taken global military action to support an international order which is conducive to these more fundamental national interests, that does not mean Australia wishes to dominate that order in any meaningful way. But, if that is the case, then why would such a nation need an SSN force of this potency? Why would a middle power on the outskirts of Southeast Asia be investing in such a significant undersea warfighting capability, one that will allow it to project power as far away as Northeast Asia and Africa? Why would the RAN be arming itself with the modern equivalent of a battle line, eight or more big gun capital ships, making it one of the 21st century's major naval powers? The simple answer is Canberra's hand is being forced. The strategic environment in which Australia exists is becoming more and more challenging. This is, in truth, an understatement. The nation is now facing the greatest period of strategic risk since the Second World War. There is only one reason why Australia's wider security environment is deteriorating so rapidly. China. The People's Liberation Army, especially its naval arm, is currently undergoing one of the largest peacetime military expansions in modern history. Fueled by a historic period of economic growth, one that has made China an economic peer of the United States, Beijing has embarked upon a shipbuilding program of truly gargantuan proportions. In fact, the size of the Chinese Navy has nearly doubled in less than two decades. In 2005, the PLAN had some 220 battle force ships, including frigates, submarines, destroyers, and cruisers. Just 15 years later, in 2020, that number had swollen to 360 the Chinese Navy is now the largest in the world. They are launching ships at a phenomenal rate. In terms of tonnage, Chinese shipyards are delivering a force that is the size of the Royal Navy every four years. As an example, in 2005, the PLA deployed 16 major surface combatants larger than frigates, including cruisers, destroyers, and aircraft carriers. This had risen to 26 in 2015, but by 2020, just five years later, that number was 43. Minor vessels, such as frigates and corvettes, went from 38 to 102 over that same period. 
In many cases, these numbers do not reveal the full extent of this massive naval expansion, as numerous older vessels have been replaced by more modern classes. That is the most rapid peacetime naval expansion in history. It even eclipses the development of the German high seas fleet prior to the Great War. In terms of surface ships, the PLA has also significantly narrowed the technological lead enjoyed by the West. The 7,500-ton Type 52D Lu Yang class destroyer is an excellent example of this process. As opposed to the Soviet sovereign many class destroyers which were the mainstay of the Chinese Navy in the early 2000s, the Lu Yang fields a number of capabilities that make it competitive with its Western contemporaries. These include the S-Band Type 346A Active Electronically Scanned Array Air Search Radar, which is a very significant improvement over the MR-710 top plate system used by the Sovereign Many. Although it may not provide any major real-world performance advantages, technologically speaking, this radar is more advanced than the passive electronically scanned array SPY-1D used by the Ali Burke and Hobart classes. Much like Western destroyers, the Type 51D uses a large vertical launch system complex to house its weapons. Its 64 cells deploy the HHQ-9 long-range surface-to-air missile, an S-300 variant, the YJ-18 supersonic anti-ship cruise missile, and the CY-5 land attack cruise missile. In terms of air warfare, the Lu Yang also employs a layered defensive complex with wide-area surface-to-air missiles, the aforementioned HHQ-9, supplemented by point defense missiles such as the HQ-10 and a 30mm close-in weapon system. These destroyers also field a substantial anti-submarine warfare capability, with onboard helicopter and comprehensive sonar suite, employing both a hull-mounted system and a towed array. Although it still lags behind its western competitors in some areas, such as over-the-horizon engagement, networking, ASW and combat system, this is certainly a very modern and capable warship. In terms of basic capability, it is essentially equivalent to a Hobart class. Some 25 of these warships are currently operational. The Lu Yang is supplemented by the 12,000 ton Type 55 large destroyer, which are classed as cruisers in the West. These very impressive vessels are essentially enlarged Type 52Ds, employing the same air search radar, weapons, VLS complex and other systems. They are, however, very heavily armed, with some 112 VLS cells deploying a range of highly potent and long-range missile systems. Eight of these behemoths are currently active with the PLA. This massive investment in the Chinese Navy goes far beyond what would be required to either defend itself or fight a local regional conflict. Perhaps nowhere is this more evident than in the development of Chinese naval aviation. Large aircraft carriers are primarily tools of power projection. They enable a nation to project air power very far away from their own shores, allowing them to conduct expeditionary warfare on a grand scale and against capable opponents, and China's investment in this area is highly revealing of its intentions. The PLA currently fields two aircraft carriers, Liaoning and Shandong. These are both based on the Soviet Kuznetsov design, which uses a stowbar arrangement. What this means is both of these vessels rely on a ski jump to facilitate short takeoffs, which does limit their utility in several key areas, such as sortie generation rate, the employment of support aircraft, such as tankers and airborne early warning and control platforms, and, potentially, the max takeoff weight that their onboard fighters can utilize. Nevertheless, both still represent a very significant carrier capability, as each can deploy two squadrons of J-15 fleet defense fighters and a significant number of helicopters. Liaoning was originally laid down in 1983 as the Soviet carrier Riga, although construction was halted when she was 68% complete. She was sold to China by Ukraine in 2000 and was eventually completed in 2012. Liaoning served as the basis for China's first domestic carrier, Shandong. Although very capable warships, these pale in comparison to the second generation of Chinese aircraft carriers. The Type 3 carrier Fujian is the largest and most technologically advanced non-US carrier ever developed. Essentially comparable to the USS Kitty Hawk, the 316 meter long, 80,000 ton Fujian is truly a supercarrier. Fielding three electromagnetic catapults, the Type 3 will likely deploy an air group composed of four strike fighter squadrons, tanker and airborne radar aircraft, and a squadron of helicopters. The Fujian is currently afloat and approaching her maiden voyage. We can expect her to enter operational status later this decade. A follow-on nuclear-powered variant, the Type 4, was intended to begin construction, but reportedly this has been delayed due to technological hurdles. We don't know how many aircraft carriers the PLAN will eventually field, potentially six, but the vessels that are currently operational or are approaching that status 
have already given the PLA the second most capable carrier force in the world. Without going into too much detail, this massive Chinese naval expansion extends to all elements of naval capability, from brand new and heavily armed corvettes to dozens of new and more technologically advanced conventional submarines. From an Australian perspective, in terms of the military threat the nation faces, it's as if the Imperial Japanese Navy has re-emerged in just over a decade. In the mid-2000s, China possessed nothing more than a Greenwater Navy, one that was barely capable of dominating its own littorals. But by the mid-2020s, it will possess a navy that can, on paper at least, project extremely meaningful levels of power against the Australian mainland, in addition to threatening Australia's sea lines of communication, leaving the nation vulnerable to attack and military coercion. Furthermore, the PLA has been investing in numerous other areas of military capability that will allow it to strike most regional powers, including Australia. These include intermediate-range ballistic missiles, hypersonics, strategic air power, offensive cyber, and, perhaps of greatest concern, a rapidly modernizing and expanding nuclear capability. This immensely destabilizing militarization is being conducted in a completely opaque way. Beijing has not even tried to reassure regional powers that its intentions are benign. Indeed, diplomatically, it has done the exact opposite. Beijing clearly aims to intimidate and coerce, rather than to reassure. This situation would be concerning enough if the power in question was abiding by international norms and respecting the sovereignty of its neighbours. But, again, China is doing exactly the opposite. Despite a ruling against them at The Hague, Beijing has laid claim to virtually the entire South China Sea, and has militarily intimidated its much weaker neighbours in the process. Philippine, Vietnamese, Malaysian and Indonesian sovereignty are essentially being railroaded by this massive Chinese claim, one that is based on an extremely dubious legal foundation and bolstered by the PLA's military superiority. Beijing continues to threaten Taiwan and its 23 million people, essentially an independent, democratic state, with blockade, bombardment and invasion despite the fact that the island has never actually been a part of the People's Republic of China. Beijing under communist rule has never actually possessed sovereignty there. The Indians have also experienced this Chinese aggression. In 2020, Chinese and Indian military forces engaged in significant firefights when the PLA occupied several positions along the Sino-Indian border. Finally, and most concerningly for Canberra, during 2020 and 2021, Australia was subjected to a campaign of military, economic and diplomatic coercion by Beijing in addition to a multi-year influence operation targeting Australian politics and political discourse more generally. This not only included tariffs on Australian exports to China, but a large-scale offensive cyber campaign that targeted critical Australian infrastructure, including Parliament. This aggression was triggered by Australian laws designed to limit foreign interference and a call by the Australian Prime Minister for an independent inquiry into the origins of the COVID-19 virus, something we still do not understand. Without meaning to exaggerate here, from a strategic perspective, this is essentially Australia's worst case scenario. The emergence of an aggressive, revisionist, authoritarian great power in East Asia, one of the three great industrialized regions of the world, especially one which is investing in a world-class navy, is the greatest strategic threat Australia can plausibly face. The last time such a power existed, the nation faced a war of national survival. Australia is an island in the corner of the world, and thus only major naval powers can pose a dire strategic threat. What makes China a different kind of strategic challenge to any the nation has faced since 1945 is Beijing possesses the fundamental power, especially its economic strength, to plausibly challenge American primacy in maritime East Asia and the Indo-Pacific more generally. Whatever you may think of American hegemony, indeed you may view it as nothing more than imperialism. The simple and unequivocal reality is that US naval primacy has been extremely beneficial for our region generally, and to Australia in particular. The United States Navy, much like the Royal Navy before it, has not only kept regional sea lines of communication free and open, the highways of global commerce upon which Australian trade moves, it has prevented a large-scale interstate war from occurring for over half a century. Even during the period prior to the Sino-American alignment of the 1970s, when East and Southeast Asia did endure significant conflict, these were largely counterinsurgencies, war of an entirely different kind in comparison to great power conflict. This regional stability has led to a historic economic flourishing, to which Australia owes much of its current wealth. Ironically, it was the free and open Indo-Pacific, 
a state of affairs underwritten by US military primacy that allowed the Chinese economic miracle to happen in the first place. Make no mistake about it, the scale of the threat Beijing poses to the current US-led regional order, in which Australia is deeply embedded and upon which Canberra relies heavily for its security and economic prosperity, is absolutely on the same order of magnitude as the Soviet Union. We have glimpsed what a region dominated by Chinese power looks like, and I would argue that such a future is not in Australia's national interest. For a nation like Australia, one that has the economic potential to develop globally significant naval forces, but could not hope to compete with China directly, submarines offer two major and interrelated advantages. They represent an asymmetric capability and are excellent tools of sea denial, two concepts which have come to dominate Australian strategic thinking. In simple terms, military asymmetry means meeting an enemy's area of strength with entirely different capabilities that do not share the same attributes, in order to, hopefully, exploit an area of vulnerability. Perhaps the archetypal example of an asymmetric weapon is the IED, or Improvised Explosive Device. Iraqi and Afghan insurgents quickly found that attempting to engage Western mechanized forces directly exclusively ended in bloody defeat. But by planting explosives in trash piles or abandoned cars and letting the enemy come to the weapon, they were able to inflict very significant casualties on their technologically superior opponent. Western ISR systems were excellent at detecting and tracking large concentrations of Iraqi armor, but finding a buried artillery shell was something else entirely. But it's not just insurgents and poorly equipped military actors that have historically relied upon asymmetric capabilities. Despite having a very large air force, when facing the enormous air power of the United States and NATO, the Soviets relied upon the surface-to-air missile system, an area of asymmetric technological advantage, rather than the air superiority fighter to counter Western air forces. Despite the weakness of the North Vietnamese Air Force, when these systems were deployed against the United States, they took a very heavy toll and required a disproportionate response to counter. Some 205 American aircraft were lost to the SA-2 and SA-7 missile systems alone. Throughout the 20th century, submarines, sea denial, and asymmetric naval warfare are the typical mix of strategies and capabilities employed by inferior naval powers. The combination of a submarine's stealth, lethality, and reach make it the perfect platform for countering an enemy with superior surface forces. During the Great War, Germany possessed one of the most powerful battle lines in the world, Despite having over 100 major warships, including 24 battleships, 16 of which were dreadnoughts, this massive fleet was unable to either break the British naval blockade or apply any significant major naval pressure upon the United Kingdom. That's because the Royal Navy had an even more powerful force concentrated at Scarpa Flow, the Grand Fleet. When the High Seas Fleet actually did attempt a major engagement with the Royal Navy, they luckily escaped annihilation at Jutland. Despite their immense investment in capital ships, the Imperial German Navy spent most of the war with its impressive high seas fleet sitting in port because it faced an opponent that enjoyed a position of superiority that approached overmatch. Because the German naval forces were symmetric or of the same kind, it did not matter how capable they were. But it was the humble submarine, then little more than a submersible torpedo boat, that caused carnage and genuinely threatened Britain's war effort. In April 1917 alone, 881,000 tons of shipping were sunk by U-boats, seven times more than the Grand Fleet lost at Jutland. Because of its stealth, the U-boat could avoid the Royal Navy's massive battle lines of dreadnought battleships and strike Britain's area of strategic vulnerability, the sea lines of communication that brought the trade London needed to survive. This was a campaign of sea denial. The Germans were attempting to deny the Royal Navy control of the sea, as opposed to gaining control of it themselves an inherently asymmetric strategy. This is a far easier task than a campaign of sea control. If you are intending to move materiel across the ocean, you have to gain control of it, at least in a local area. This means sanitizing an area of battle space, removing any potential threat, remembering that your merchant marine are vulnerable to virtually all warships, no matter how small. Although, by the end of the war, U-boat losses were brought under control, they took an immense toll and required a disproportionate level of capability to counter. The Germans applied the same strategy again in the Second World War to even greater effect. This time the Kriegsmarine surface fleet was not even a peer of the Royal Navy, possessing only two modern battleships in 1940, the undergun Scharnhorst class, compared to the Royal Navy's 15. By December 1941, it was facing an Anglo-American alliance, the two greatest naval powers on Earth. 
Germany was a minor maritime power by comparison. Nevertheless, by investing in an asymmetric capability, the submarine, and by waging a campaign of sea denial, the Kriegsmarine was able to apply immense pressure on the Western Allies. By the beginning of 1943, shipping losses in the North Atlantic were so severe that they were compromising Allied operations globally. Despite their immense aggregate naval power, the Western Allies were primarily amphibious militaries, meaning that everything they did anywhere in the world required a transport ship. With concurrent operations in the Pacific, Burma, the Mediterranean, Britain and the Soviet Union, the Allies never had enough shipping to do everything they had planned. This was a critical vulnerability upon which the Germans applied very significant pressure. Some historians have argued that the submarine campaign was actually not a major threat to the Allies. The primary evidence raised in support of this position is the total tonnage of shipping produced by Western shipyards during the war, which far exceeds the amount of merchant shipping lost, 21 million tons sunk compared to 38 million tons of new shipping. Indeed, the Germans only exceeded the monthly capacity of Britain's shipyards twice, and this gap only widened once the United States entered the war. Therefore, this line of argument contends, Britain was never really in danger of isolation, the Allies were never really close to losing the U-boat war, and the threat of the submarine has been grossly exaggerated. But this reasoning, which has been advanced by some excellent historians, misses the forest for the trees. Whether Britain was brought to its knees or the Allied war effort was fatally crippled is not the appropriate standard by which to measure the success of this campaign. Yes, by the middle of 1943, the Battle of the Atlantic had been won, but our reasoning cannot stop there. The simple fact is it took a disproportionate Allied response to achieve this victory. At the Casablanca Conference in February 1943, the Allied combined chiefs of staff, with the agreement of Churchill and Roosevelt, decided that the defeat of the U-boat in the Atlantic was to be the highest Allied strategic priority. It was to be prioritized, in terms of both technological and physical resources, over aid to the Soviets, operations in the Mediterranean, the build-up of American forces in Britain, and the war against Japan. In early 1943, nothing mattered more to the Western Allies than securing the Atlantic sea lines of communication. In contrast, the U-boat campaign was only ever a minor element of the German war effort, one that was primarily focused on the war in the East. Considering how inferior Germany was as a maritime power, and the gargantuan disparity in naval resources, this was quite an achievement, and had they been more focused on the U-boat war, the technological lead gained by the Western powers may well have been made good, especially through more advanced platforms such as the Type 21 U-boat. That is how effective a strategy which combines an asymmetric capability, like the submarine, with a campaign of sea denial can be. The Soviets were also quick to learn this lesson. Although Moscow ended the Second World War as a true superpower, and arguably the greatest land power the world had ever seen, it was now facing an entirely new kind of enemy. Unlike Germany, the liberal democracies were primarily air and naval powers, a set of nations which enjoyed a formidable economic advantage over the Soviet Union. Because of how militarized the USSR was, and the colossal peacetime land force it was able to maintain, at the beginning of any conflict with NATO, the Soviet army would have a very significant force ratio advantage. Nevertheless, with their massive economies and access to global resources, the Western powers had a good chance of winning a long war. Thus, it was imperative that the Soviets win any war in Europe quickly, but if the immense latent power of North America could effectively cross the Atlantic, this was going to become increasingly difficult. Therefore, the Soviet Union had to contest the North Atlantic sea lanes in any war with NATO, but there was absolutely no chance of doing so with symmetric capabilities. The United States was now, arguably, the most formidable naval power in history. As an example, during the war, it built 24 20,000 ton Essex-class fleet carriers, which were soon joined by the ever more potent Midway, Forrestal and Kitty Hawk classes. Given its economic inferiority and the need to maintain massive land forces, there was simply no way the Soviets could compete with the United States Navy directly. Thus, Moscow built the Cold War Soviet Navy as a sea denial force. In essence, the Soviets aimed to use military asymmetry to both counter US global power projection capabilities and interdict critical sea lines of communication. The submarine in general, and the nuclear attack submarine in particular, was an absolutely foundational platform in enabling this strategy. Throughout the Cold War, the Soviet Union built the largest submarine force in the world. 
During the 1950s alone, the Soviets produced over 300 diesel electric attack submarines, which would wage an interdiction campaign in the North Atlantic. The second generation of Soviet boats, some 130 of which were built between 1958 and 1966, were specifically designed to engage US carrier forces. These classes largely incorporated two critical technologies, nuclear propulsion and the anti-ship cruise missile. By 1975, the Soviet Navy fielded 280 attack submarines, a large proportion of which were missile-armed SSNs. Between 1945 and 1991, the Soviet Union produced 727 submarines, 492 with diesel, electric or closed cycle propulsion, and 235 SSNs. This compares with the US total of 212 submarines, 43 with diesel propulsion, 22 of which were from World War II programs, and 169 nuclear submarines. Not only was the Soviet submarine force intended to sink merchant shipping in the North Atlantic and Pacific Ocean basins, but its SSN specifically were a core element in the wider Soviet anti-access area denial complex, a system that was designed to prevent US carrier forces from approaching the Soviet coast. The nuclear submarine and the anti-ship cruise missile armed aircraft, which would later be supplemented by ASCM armed surface vessels, were the primary means by which the Soviet Navy aimed to engage the USN's formidable battle forces, especially carrier battle groups. Rather than hoping to build supercarriers themselves, the inferior Soviets utilized asymmetric capabilities to meet this formidable threat, relying on platforms like the massive and extremely heavily armed Oscar-class SSGN. Provided with targeting information by the wider Soviet Ocean Surveillance System and its supporting battle network, the Oscar would fire volleys of the deadly P-700 Granite supersonic anti-ship cruise missile, NATO codename SSN-19 Shipwreck, from a range of 300 nautical miles. With 24 of these massive weapons on board, the Oscar posed a deadly threat to NATO battle forces in the blue waters of the North Atlantic, especially when its missile fire was combined with other submarines, surface vessels, and aircraft. As we can see, the strategy Australia has selected to meet the immense threat posed by China and the PLAN specifically is a well-trodden historical path. Even in generic terms, because of their basic attributes, submarines are the preferred platforms of inferior naval powers but in this instance, they represent an even greater asymmetric advantage. The Chinese economic miracle had many strategic consequences, but perhaps one of the most important is China's economic integration within the global economy. Unlike the days of Mao, where Beijing strove for as much self-reliance as possible, Chinese industry is utterly dependent upon both global export markets and foreign sources of raw materials. For example, over $3 trillion of exports left China in 2021. That same year, it imported over a million tons of iron ore and 81 million tons of crude oil. Without these critical imports of raw materials, the massive Chinese manufacturing sector, typically an immense strength during wartime, will come to a screeching halt. China may possess 52% of the world's steel production, but without iron ore to feed them, these colossal blast furnaces will be nothing more than giant industrial monuments. Virtually all of these critical imports move by sea through the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Even moderate disruption of liquid fuel or critical resource supply will generate severe price shocks within China, which will, in turn, cause significant economic disruption and, potentially, political instability. Because of its geography and the structure of its economy, government and society, China is more vulnerable to a trade interdiction campaign than any other major power. A potent, technologically advanced Australian submarine force at least one that can range across the vast Indian and Pacific Ocean basins, could potentially wreak havoc amongst these critical sea lines of communication, savaging China's merchant shipping. Thus, the ADF can apply asymmetric pressure upon a critical area of Chinese vulnerability. Undersea warfare is also an area of Chinese technological weakness. Over the last two decades, the PLA has made remarkable strides across multiple domains of warfare. From their warships to their fighters to their anti-ship cruise missiles, the Chinese have rapidly bridged a technological gulf which once seemed insurmountable. Although in many of these areas they still lag behind the West, they have narrowed the gap substantially, and in some niche cases are actually now world leaders. For example, the PLA has constructed a joint anti-access area denial complex composed of an ocean surveillance system, battle network and diversified anti-ship cruise and ballistic missile capability that could credibly prevent the USN from operating its battle forces in the Western Pacific, or at least impose significant losses if it chose to do so. 
But in submarine technology generally, and anti-submarine warfare in particular, the West has been able to maintain or even extend its technological lead. For example, Chinese nuclear submarines are very unstealthy. In terms of signature management, they still lag far behind the last generation of Soviet platforms. The US Naval Institute estimates the Type 93 Shang-2 class nuclear submarine, the mainstay of the PLAN SSN force, is less stealthy than a 1970s era Soviet Victor III. The most modern Chinese SSN, the Type 95, has a larger acoustic signature than an Akula one Nuclear reactors are inherently noisy, and making a very stealthy SSN is an enormous technological challenge, one that cannot really be made good by relying upon advances in the commercial sector. This lead also extends to other critical technologies such as sensors and combat systems. The PLA's ASW capabilities and doctrine writ large are generally embryonic, especially in a blue water setting. Thus, by acquiring advanced Western submarines, Australia is investing in an area of real technological advantage. Just like the Soviets, the RAN will rely upon an SSN to engage hostile carrier strike groups, rather than trying to develop symmetric capabilities we can never hope to match. Finally, unlike the RAN surface fleet, its submarine force is essentially immune from the PLA's A2 AD complex, meaning it can readily operate in the South and East China Seas, which will be critical in any Allied defense of Taiwan. So, this explains why Australia is selecting the wider strategy it has, and why submarines are, and will be, a critical capability for the ADF. But why do we need a nuclear submarine, as opposed to a less expensive and far less technologically challenging conventional boat? After all, couldn't all of the roles and functions envisaged here have been fulfilled by the attack class? Given its immense range, some 18,000 nautical miles at 10 knots, and its advanced sensors and heavy weapons payload, surely a 12-boat attack class fleet would have been able to pose a severe threat to Chinese maritime trade and PLA and battle forces. Well, conventional submarines suffer from a number of very significant limitations, in addition to equally significant performance advantages that are offered by nuclear propulsion, which simply can't be redressed by any diesel electric submarine, no matter how technologically advanced. In order to illustrate these differences, we need to go back to basics. For propulsion, a diesel electric submarine, which is designated as an SSK, utilizes stored energy in a battery bank to drive an electric motor. It does this whether it is submerged or motoring on the surface. When submerged and the battery bank is discharged, the submarine has to return to the surface and snorkel, meaning steaming at periscope depth and placing a tube above the water. This allows the boat to run a set of diesel generators to recharge the battery bank, which rely on both a stored amount of diesel fuel and oxygen from the atmosphere. Some submarines incorporate a set of technologies that are designed to allow the boat to recharge its battery bank without relying upon atmospheric oxygen. Called Air Independent Propulsion, or AIP for short, these technologies either supplement the main diesel generators or, less typically, replace them entirely. Although there are several different forms of AIP technology, from methanol reformer fuel cells to Stirling engines, all rely on some form of oxidizer to replace atmospheric oxygen. This is combined with a fuel source to generate electricity. Generally speaking, AIP systems tend to provide a comparatively small amount of electrical power, which can be used to supplement, rather than to replace, the primary diesel generators. These systems can, however, extend the amount of time a submarine can stay submerged before needing to come to the surface and snorkel. Nuclear submarines, on the other hand, rely on nuclear fission to power the vessel. Inside an SSN's nuclear reactor, uranium undergoes fission, which generates an enormous amount of heat. This energy is used to boil water, which then drives a turbine. This can either directly propel the vessel via a steam turbine and drive shaft, or be used to generate electricity, which then powers an electric motor. Unlike conventional submarines, an SSN never has to surface, even to exchange air. It simply uses electrical energy to generate oxygen and fresh water from the ocean. Apart from the very significant costs associated with nuclear technology, one of the primary advantages of diesel electric submarines is it is far less technologically challenging to make one stealthy. As anyone who has heard an electric car drive down the road can attest, electric propulsion is an inherently quiet technology. Batteries have no moving parts, and a permanent magnet electric motor makes far less noise than an internal combustion engine. Nuclear reactors, on the other hand, are extremely complex machines with numerous moving parts. Pressurized water reactors require a constant flow of coolant to move through the core, 
which acts as a moderator, mediates the core's temperature, and allows for heat exchange and power generation. The vast majority of reactors rely on coolant pumps to do this, which creates an unavoidable amount of noise. Obviously, there are many ways you can mitigate this acoustic signature, such as hull isolation, but this is a very difficult technological challenge. Only the most advanced marine reactors, such as the SG-9 used on the Virginia-class SSN, have alleviated the requirement for reactor pumps. Unless travelling at very high speed, the extremely dense core is cooled by convection alone, making the Virginia an exceptionally quiet SSN. But, for the vast majority of nuclear reactors, a technologically comparable conventional submarine will tend to be more stealthy, at least while it is running on its battery bank. The problem comes when the batteries are depleted. As noted previously, diesel-electric submarines have to run an energy cycle, meaning they have to come to the surface and recharge their batteries. During this period, all of the advantages of electric propulsion are lost. Diesel generators are noisy, and whilst they are running, the vessel has to remain at the surface with a snorkel exposed. This makes the submarine detectable by both surface search radars and airborne assets, including space-based surveillance systems. As one can hopefully see, a submarine is extremely vulnerable whilst it is snorkeling. Not only is it broadcasting its presence to the world by running its noisy engines, but it is tethered to the surface, where it can easily be detected in the visible, infrared, and electromagnetic spectrums. Depth is a submarine's best friend. As you move through the water column, you will often find areas where the water temperature rapidly changes. This divide is called a thermocline and is often caused by solar heating of the surface layer. Thermoclines badly disrupt sonar performance, allowing deeply diving submarines to hide from both active and passive systems located on the surface. This is why variable depth sonars are so important. Additionally, deep diving submarines can achieve higher speeds without cavitation, a very noisy process of bubble nucleation on the propeller. Depth also gives the boat the ability to maneuver in three dimensions. Thus, by forcing the submarine to come shallow, the need to snorkel removes one of its greatest protections. The amount of time a submarine has to snorkel is referred to as the indiscretion rate, or the period in which it is forced to operate in a non-stealthy manner. For the majority of conventional submarines, the indiscretion rate can be as high as 30%, meaning a third of the time, on average, it has to be snorkeling. The indiscretion rate is dependent upon what the submarine is currently doing. If it is creeping along at three knots, the boat may be able to go hours or days without recharging its batteries. However, if it is in transit and steaming quickly, it may need to run its diesel engines for very long periods of time. This is a critical vulnerability of diesel electric submarines and one that is often overlooked by SSK advocates. Although this may not be a major problem in the open ocean, where the boat can readily disengage and reach a place of relative safety when operating in highly contested waters, such as the South China Sea, where hostile sensor coverage is pervasive and one will be facing a very large number of enemy vessels, the need to snorkel at an inopportune time could well be a fatal shortcoming. This vulnerability is only being made more acute by the increasing capability of the PLA's satellite intelligence network, which can visibly detect a snorkeling SSK. Nuclear submarines, on the other hand, never have to surface or operate in an unstealthy manner. Once they leave base, these vessels simply dive deep and disappear. Finding a very quiet western SSN in the vast expanses of the Indian or Pacific Oceans is a fool's errand. Certainly, satellites will not help you. Therefore, despite the inherent advantages of electric propulsion, over its entire patrol, a nuclear submarine will be far more stealthy than a typical SSK. This is a critical advantage when operating in highly contested areas. In any case, the most advanced nuclear boats are so quiet that it's unclear exactly how much of an advantage electric propulsion provides. This is the first major capability enhancement offered by an SSN that is foundational to the RAN's operational requirement, stealth. The second very significant advantage provided by nuclear propulsion is kinematic performance, or to use more simple terminology, speed. Marine reactors produce an enormous amount of power, Virginia's power plant, the SG-9, generates an estimated 210 megawatts of thermal energy. This drives a secondary steam turbine that delivers 40,000 shaft horsepower, or 29.8 megawatts, to a pump jet propulsor. 
In terms of total electricity production, if we assume a reasonably typical efficiency of 35%, the SG9 can generate 73.5 megawatts of electricity, including propulsive power. That is a truly colossal amount of energy. A typical diesel electric submarine has about 3 megawatts of generation capacity. The Collins class, which is renowned for having a very low indiscretion rate and ability to recharge its batteries rapidly, has 4.2. Thus, in very basic terms, an SG9 reactor provides 20 times the amount of power available to a typical diesel electric submarine. Even accounting for the much greater size of the SSN, for example, a Block 4 Virginia displaces about four times as much water as the German Type 214 SSK, this still represents a massive difference in available power. All of this excess electricity has many productive uses, but the most obvious is kinematics. Nuclear submarines are fast, really fast. Although top speeds are classified, it is estimated that the Virginia is capable of operating at speeds well in excess of 30 knots. Several Soviet-era submarines, such as the Akula, have disclosed top speeds as high as 35 knots. Contemporaneous conventional submarines, such as the Soviet Kilo, can barely manage to reach 22. Additionally, because of the immense energy density of nuclear fuel, an SSN can move this fast indefinitely, whereas attaining an SSK's top speed will drain its battery bank in a matter of minutes. This additional speed provides very significant operational and tactical advantages. One of the least obvious, but most important, is operational mobility. SSNs can cover vast distances quickly. A deep diving, pump jet equipped Virginia can make whole ocean passages at speeds over 20 knots, more than twice as fast as a typical electric boat. Although certainly not the quietest mode of travel, if there is a time sensitive target or the boat needs to rapidly relocate in order to intercept a fast moving enemy, such as a carrier strike group, an SSN can do this far more effectively than any conventional competitor. Like all ambush predators, in order to be most effective, SSKs typically need to quietly pre-position themselves in advantageous locations, such as geographical choke points. SSNs are more akin to a great white shark rapidly prowling the ocean's vast distances hunting for their prey. Again, just in general terms, greater speed and greater operational mobility just gives your platform greater flexibility. A smaller force can be in more places more often and better respond to a rapidly changing operational picture, a critical capability for a nation with such vast areas of maritime geography to cover. The superior operational mobility also effectively increases the range of these submarines. As a typical patrol length is limited by crew endurance, rather than fuel storage, the faster you can move over a 90 day period, the greater the area you can effectively cover. Obviously, this superior operational mobility is tempered by the requirement to maintain stealth. Screaming around at 35 knots will alert the whole world to your presence, but nonetheless, it is still a very significant advantage. Superior kinematic performance also has many tactical advantages. There are numerous tales of the surprising performance of advanced conventional submarines in exercises with the US Navy. Perhaps most famously, in 2005, the USS Ronald Reagan was sunk by the 1,600-ton Swedish submarine Gotland. Less famously, at RIMPAC 1998, the Oberon-class submarine HMAS Oxley also sank a US carrier. This time it was USS Carl Vinson. In 2005, it exercised Silent Fury, the Collins-class submarine HMAS Rankin effectively penetrated the USN's defences and sank a destroyer, its designated target. These feats look very impressive on paper and have led many to extol the virtues of small and cheap conventional submarines, especially the AIP-equipped Gotland. As much as we all love an underdog story, like the plucky little Swedish sub running rings around the mighty USN, unfortunately, reality is a little less romantic. Firstly, these are exercises which are designed to train people and thus have very restrictive rules of engagement. For example, when engaging Gotland, the Reagan strike group was not allowed to maneuver out of a very constrained geographical area, was limited to a top speed of 10 knots, could not use active sonar, had no P3 Orion support, and could not use ASW helos such as Seahawk. In Silent Fury, the target destroyer sunk by Rankin was anchored at a known location between two islands, allowing the Australian submarine to slowly and quietly approach the target using the islands as cover. 
None of this is to argue that the Collins, Oberon, or Gotland classes are not very quiet and dangerous submarines, but clearly these exercises were not realistic. Had Ronald Reagan been operating normally and steaming at 30 knots, Gotland would probably have never even caught her. These exercises have led to a general overestimation of the capability of diesel electric submarines, especially the AIP equipped Gotland, which has now attained a semi mythical status. One of the most glaring omissions from these exercises is what happened after these submarines launched their torpedoes. Apparently, Gotland was able to make several attacks on Ronald Reagan undetected. However, torpedoes are comparatively noisy. This close range fire would have probably been detected and localized very rapidly. Indeed, modern destroyers are equipped with dedicated torpedo detection systems. At the end of Silent Fury, Rankin announced her kill by playing the song, I Come From A Land Down Under, into the water, which quickly alerted the defenders. This was apparently the end of the exercise. But this immediately raises the question, if that was a real engagement, what happens next? A diesel electric submarine may well be able to penetrate a hostile task force's defenses and maneuver into a firing position undetected, relying upon its very quiet electric motor. But what about when it has launched its torpedoes and has to become defensive, because the whole task force now knows exactly where it is. With a limited top speed and a battery bank that has probably been partially depleted by the ingress, the ability of an SSK to effectively run once it has been detected is limited. Essentially, conventional submarines survive by stealth alone. Even if the ASW forces cannot get a precise location and firing solution, by simply keeping the vessel submerged, they can slowly deplete its battery bank, a situation called a hold down. Although the AIP-equipped Gotland could avoid this problem, its limited top speed would still greatly inhibit its ability to maneuver effectively. If the little Swedish submarine was being swarmed by multiple dipping sonar-equipped MH60 Romeos, its much-vaunted AIP system would not save it. An SSN, on the other hand, can run fast. In a similar situation, the nuclear-powered submarine can dive deep and move so quickly that it becomes difficult for the ASW forces to hunt. Indeed, in the cat and mouse game that is anti-submarine warfare, the ability to rapidly change depth, reposition and re-engage is a critical tactical advantage provided by nuclear propulsion. Furthermore, when completely defensive, a nuclear submarine can maneuver so quickly it can even outrun a torpedo, at least under some conditions. When fired, a modern torpedo searches within a predefined kill box. Anything outside of this area will not be engaged. Thus, Assuming you detect the torpedo early enough, if you can reposition rapidly, you can escape this area, defeating the incoming shot. Additionally, again assuming the fire is detected early, an SSN can simply outrun the incoming torpedo. Modern torpedoes often have maximum speeds that are only 15 to 20 knots faster than a typical SSN, usually in the 45 to 55 knot range. If there is still enough distance between the target and torpedo, the SSN can simply run, hoping to reach the torpedo's maximum range before it is intercepted, and at least buying it time to deploy countermeasures. This is why keeping your torpedo shot undetected from the enemy for as long as possible is critical in any submarine duel, and also why gaining a detection advantage is so important. First look, first shot, first kill. All of this assumes that the torpedo is detected at long range, which is dependent upon the technological quality of both the torpedo and the submarine sensors, but the defensive advantage provided by superior kinematic performance is clear. SSKs simply cannot evade in the same way. There are numerous other advantages of nuclear propulsion. The abundant energy generated by a nuclear reactor allows an SSN to provide copious amounts of hotel electric power, meaning the electricity that is not used to propel the vessel. There is so much available electricity that these submarines can run more powerful sensor suites, more capable combat data systems, desalinate water, generate oxygen, and even power numerous underwater drones. The Virginia class has so much hotel electric power that a high energy laser is being developed for her photonics mast, what used to be a periscope, which is designed to shoot down drones and ASW helicopters. Another attractive advantage of an SSN is its increased land attack potential. Their superior stealth, range and endurance, combined with a large enough displacement to comfortably house a significant number of land attack cruise missiles, makes them far more effective in this role than contemporary SSKs. One of the greatest advantages to the RAN is the range and endurance of nuclear submarines. The combination of high speed, exceptional crewing amenities and large size allows SSNs to easily traverse massive distances. 
typically a nation with Australia's specific range requirements, such as patrol areas that may be 3,500 nautical miles away from its major bases, which by necessity need to be located near its major population centres, would want an SSN fleet. Most diesel-electric submarine operators use their boats for coastal defence. Really, a nuclear submarine was always the best fit for Australia's requirements. It was only the nuclear taboo and lack of a domestic nuclear industry that prevented the ADF from acquiring this technology earlier. Perhaps the best way to think of the attack class was the closest Australia could come to a nuclear submarine without actually having a nuclear reactor on board. It was literally a full-sized French nuclear boat, complete with pump jet propulsion, a large weapons load, and massive range. But it still suffered from the same shortcomings as all conventional submarines. But what about air-independent propulsion? Surely this was a far less risky and far less expensive solution to the ADF submarine problem. AIP is one of those technologies that has reached a semi-mythical status amongst some areas of the general public. Its efficacy is, generally speaking, seriously overestimated by some within the wider strategic community, who view it as, essentially, a conventional replacement for nuclear propulsion. After all, some AIP-equipped boats have a submerged endurance that rivals nuclear submarines. The first 10 units of the Soryu class were equipped with four Cockham Sterling AIP systems. Whilst moving at a leisurely six knots, Soryu has a submerged endurance of over 6,000 nautical miles. Undeniably, this is very impressive and on paper would address the indiscretion rate vulnerability of diesel electric submarines that is so concerning to the RAN. If a Soryu can dive deep and stay deep for weeks, just like an SSN, then why even bother with nuclear propulsion? As much as these AIP technologies can potentially offset some of the major limitations of diesel electric propulsion, such as dramatically improving the indiscretion rate whilst the AIP system is active, the technology also has significant penalties. All AIP systems use some form of oxidizer to offset the absence of oxygen from the atmosphere. This tends to be volume intensive. Thus, for an AIP system to provide a meaningful enhancement to submerged endurance, it has to be relatively large. Whether it relies on a Stirling engine or a fuel cell, these assemblies take up significant room and weight. For example, the fuel cell AIP system used by the Type 216 is about the same size as the engine room. The longer the AIP endurance, the larger the oxidizer tanks need to be. All of this means a significant penalty in terms of range and patrol length. There are three things that limit the effective range of a conventional submarine. The amount of fuel on board, stores of items like food, and finally hotel services, things like mess rooms, gyms, galleys, and all the other internal facilities the crew needs. If you cram too many people into too small a space, you will limit the effective range of the boat by placing too much pressure on the crew. Submariners lead punishing lives. They need whatever limited internal space they have. This is why, generally speaking, those nations that do utilize AIP submarines, such as Sweden and Japan, do not have extremely long patrols in areas several thousand nautical miles away from base. They tend to operate them very close to home. In order to make an Australian AIP submarine work, at least one with submerged endurance that approached a nuclear submarine, it could not be based at HMAS Stirling. To even reach typical patrol areas such as the South China Sea, the fleet would have to be deployed at a forward operating base much farther north. There are many serious disadvantages to forward deploying submarines in this manner. Typically major naval bases are located near major population centres so they can be supported by a large scale civilian workforce and to ensure personnel retention. This is necessary for the completion of regular maintenance requirements. Thus, Australian boats will still have to be permanently based near its major cities and then forward deployed before beginning a patrol. This process would unnecessarily lengthen patrol times for the crews, negatively impacting platform efficiency and morale. These new bases would be expensive to establish, man and maintain. They would also be much more vulnerable to the PLA's long range strike systems, meaning they would have to be heavily fortified and defended. The development of the PLA's intermediate range ballistic missile arsenal is compelling the United States to stage its forces farther away from China, including in Australia. This should immediately raise doubts as to the wisdom of selecting a submarine which requires basing that is closer to this ever increasing threat. Significant damage to said forward operating base would cripple the RAN's ability to operate its submarines north of the equator. HMA Sterling, on the other hand, enjoys immense strategic depth 
largely insulating it from this very significant threat. As we can see, this is a very poor solution, all for a submarine that would still offer inferior aggregate performance and would still not be able to reach far-flung patrol areas such as Northeast Asia or the Persian Gulf. But that's not the only problem with AIP. These systems generate a very small amount of energy. The Stirling engines on board Gotland generate a tiny 75 kilowatts of power. This is minuscule in comparison to a nuclear reactor and greatly limits the submarine's performance whilst relying upon the Stirling engine. Generally speaking, AIP systems are only really good for slowly recharging the batteries if the submarine is being very frugal with its energy expenditure. Soryu and Gotland can only maintain their weeks of submerged performance if they creep along at speeds much lower than 10 knots, massively limiting their operational and tactical mobility. For the kind of large, highly capable submarine Australia specified in the attack class, complete with a powerful sonar suite, pump jet and advanced combat system, power hungry components, in comparison to just using a diesel generator, these AIP systems offered limited advantages that simply did not balance the performance costs. Perhaps the most telling example of the limitations of AIP for an Australian submarine is the fact that the ADF has now examined the technology three times and rejected it three times. When Collins was first introduced, the DSTO tested the Cockham Stirling engine used on Gotland, and it was decided that, in the worlds of Australian submariner and engineer Paul Greenfield, Collins as it is now can stay submerged for such a long time and at such a low rate of indiscretion that the refit of an AIP system is not really needed and would simply not have any cost benefit. The technology was again rejected when the winner of C-1000 was selected. The attack class would only feature traditional diesel electric propulsion. It was evaluated for a third time as part of the Collins Life of Type Extension program and, again, was not selected for inclusion. Even the Japanese are now moving away from AIP. The last two units of the Soryu class have returned to a conventional diesel electric arrangement. The massive space and weight of these AIP systems is now being used to house a much larger bank of lithium ion batteries. Citing the very slow recharge rate of the Stirling engines, the Japanese have decided that they would simply get superior performance from a much larger lithium ion system, which can hold roughly twice as much energy as a lead acid battery bank. This is despite the fact that the boat will now have a much higher rate of indiscretion. In essence, the very limited performance provided by the AIP system was simply not worth the benefits in terms of submerged endurance. If we now compare an AIP system to a nuclear reactor, it becomes readily apparent that there is, in fact, no real comparison. A nuclear submarine will provide the RAN with a submerged endurance that is far better than any AIP equipped boat. It will operate at typical speeds that are four times faster, allowing for enormous advantages in operational and tactical mobility. It will have a range that is far superior to even the attack class. It will have a weapons payload that dwarfs the Soryu and have a non-existent indiscretion rate. Australia's SSNs will be faster, stealthier and more lethal than any AIP equipped submarine that has ever been fielded. Given these massive technological advantages and the enormous strategic challenge the ADF faces, it's not hard to see why the RAN's future will be nuclear. The submarine that will be the mainstay of the RAN's SSN force throughout the 21st century will be the SSN AUKUS. This awkwardly named class of nuclear attack submarine is essentially a development of the Royal Navy's SSN-R program. Produced by Rolls-Royce and BAE Systems, the SSN-R was intended to replace the currently operational Astute class SSNs, with construction intended to commence once the four-boat Dreadnought-class SSBN had been delivered. At its outset, the SSNR was a very advanced attack submarine design, keeping many of the best features of the Astute whilst addressing its primary weaknesses. In addition to its large size and formidable weapons payload, some 7,800 tons submerged and 38 weapons, Astute incorporated many cutting-edge technologies. For example, HMS Astute deploys the 2076 sonar suite, Composed of a series of bow, flank, and towed array systems, the 2076 suite shares a high degree of commonality with the 2087 system that will be deployed on the Type 26 Global Combat Ship and its derivatives, including the Hunter-class frigate. This system is widely considered to be the best surfaced ASW sonar suite operational in the world, especially its low-frequency active element, which can detect even the most quiet submarines at tactically significant ranges. The Astute is, certainly, a world-class nuclear attack submarine, but it does have some significant issues. The major problem with the Astute class is the reactor design. 
First completed in 1985, the PWR-2 is a second-generation naval reactor. When equipped with the highly enriched uranium core H, its most modern iteration, the PWR-2 is able to provide a 30-year refueling cycle. As it was originally designed to power the Trafalgar-class SSBN, the PWR-2 is a wide reactor. Thus, in order to use it on the Astute class, the hull had to be widened, giving Astute its uniquely girthy appearance. Although a capable marine reactor, the PWR-2 is a highly complex, large, and dated design. Not only does this impose limitations on the design of the submarine, but it has led to significant safety concerns. Although fielded in the 1980s, the PWR-2 is an iterative development of the first-generation reactor designs that were founded upon the initial exchange of information between the United States and the United Kingdom in the 1960s. Like all pressurized water reactors, the PWR-2 is vulnerable to a fault in the primary coolant circuit, which would cause a rapid depressurization and boiling off of the cooling water. The resulting heat would cause the fuel cladding to melt, leading to a release of radioactive material outside of the fuel core. Commercial reactors have several layers of safety systems which are designed to inject additional coolant into the core, passively cool the fuel if no coolant can be provided, and, at the worst case, contain any release of radioactive material. In the words of the UK military's defence board, British marine reactors, specifically the PWR2, compare poorly with commercial nuclear safety benchmarks. In addition to safety concerns, HMS Astute also had significant performance issues. The Astute class uses a steam turbine to transfer energy from the reactor to the propulsor via a drive shaft and gearbox. Problems with this gearing led to the first of class failing to achieve its design top speed. Although this speed is classified, one source reported that the Astute could not even keep pace with the Queen Elizabeth class carrier, implying that the boat could not make 30 knots. Although by 2015 this problem had been successfully addressed, the severity of this speed restriction means questions still remain regarding the Astute's overall kinematic performance, at least amongst those of us that are limited to open source analysis. Finally, although it employs the Tomahawk land attack cruise missile, the Astute does not utilize a vertical launch system. Instead, it relies upon a torpedo tube launched variant, which is not being used by the USN and is no longer in production. Essentially, all of these problems were addressed in the design of the Dreadnought class SSBN, the cornerstone of the United Kingdom's independent nuclear deterrent. The four-boat Dreadnought class will enable the Royal Navy to continue Operation Relentless, its continuous at-sea deterrent, well into the 21st century. The Dreadnought is an extremely advanced nuclear submarine, incorporating a number of significant improvements over the last generation Astute and Vanguard class boats. First and foremost is its reactor design. Dreadnought is powered by the third generation PWR-3 reactor. A far more modern design, the PWR-3 is not only smaller, simpler and safer than its predecessor, it is both less expensive to maintain and provides increased performance. For example, the PWR-3 contains 30% less parts than the PWR-2. Although not explicitly stated by the UK government, it's quite likely that Rolls-Royce was given access to the General Electric SG-9 Marine Reactor, the power plant used by the Virginia class, continuing the decades of nuclear collaboration between the United States and the United Kingdom. Describing the PWR-3 as an American reactor is probably an inaccuracy. Rather than simply a copy of the SG-9, Rolls-Royce have more probably simply incorporated many of the improvements developed by Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, the original designer. Much like the SG-9, the PWR-3 does not require refueling for the life of the submarine. Unless it is operating at full power, it also does not utilize coolant pumps, relying instead upon convection to cool the core, improving safety, and drastically reducing its acoustic signature. This new and improved reactor now powers a turboelectric drive system. Unlike Astute, which uses steam power to turn a turbine, gearbox, and drive shaft, the PWR-3 simply generates electricity through the use of a steam generator, which then powers an all-electric drive system. This is the propulsion system used by the Type 26 and Hunter class frigates, which greatly reduces their acoustic signature. Electric propulsion is inherently quiet, and the lack of a mechanical link between the turbine and pump jet means the whole reactor and turbine assembly can be acoustically isolated from the hull. Dreadnought is not only quiet, it is specifically designed to minimize its vulnerability to active sonars, which are becoming more important in contemporary undersea warfare. Like many modern boats, Dreadnought uses anechoic tiles. Akin to the radar absorbent materials used on a stealth fighter, these tiles are designed to absorb acoustic energy, reducing the reflected sonar pulse. 
Additionally, the submarine is designed with a double hull, with the second hull surrounding the cylindrical pressure vessel. Again, much like the use of planned form alignment on a stealth aircraft, this allows the submarine to be specifically shaped to reflect acoustic energy away from the emission source without compromising structural integrity. This greater design flexibility also allows for the use of a more efficient shape, increasing performance. The space between the inner and outer hull is filled with additional anechoic material, further reducing the boat's active acoustic signature. The 17,000 ton dreadnought will deploy the Trident 2 D5 submarine launched ballistic missile, which are housed in a common missile compartment. These four missile segments are identical to those used by the Columbia class SSBN. The dreadnought will deploy 12 missiles as opposed to the Columbia 16, meaning three common missile compartments as opposed to four. In all, the Dreadnought will be significantly stealthier than both the Vanguard and Astute, all whilst providing increased performance and the same excellent sensor suite. Perhaps the best way to think of the SSNR, the baseline design of the AUKUS class, is an attack variant of the Dreadnought. It will use the same PWR3 reactor, the same stealthy propulsion system, the same control layout, the same excellent sensor suite, and the same stealthy double hull. These features alone would make the SSNR one of the most deadly and capable attack submarines of the 21st century, but the SSN AUKUS will be even more potent. One of the major barriers to Australia joining the SSNR program is compatibility with Australian mandated weapons and systems. The Royal Australian Navy has heavily invested in developing submarine technology, both independently and jointly with the United States. For example, the Mark 48 ADCAP Common Broadband Advanced Sonar System Heavyweight Torpedo, which is currently operational, was jointly developed by the RAN and USN. The Collins-class submarine uses a variant of the AN-BYG-1 combat system, utilised in the Virginia class, which was modified to meet the RAN's requirements. This excellent combat system has not only revolutionised the Collins-class SSGs, it was mandated for the attack class. Combat data systems are an often overlooked but absolutely critical element in submarine or warship design. They effectively act as the ship's central nervous system, connecting sensors, weapons and people to form an integrated whole. These systems condense the flood of information generated by the vessel's sonars into a coherent picture of the battle space. Early in its service life, the Collins class was badly hobbled by its underperforming combat data system, which acted as a bottleneck to the boat's impressive sonar suite, dramatically limiting its performance. These technologies are not only what the RAN prefers, they represent significant investments by the Australian government, who partially owns the intellectual property. Any future Australian SSN would have to include these Australian technologies and capabilities. Thus, although it was about 70% complete, in order to meet Australia's requirements, the SSNR design was substantially modified. The class would now use a jointly developed combat data system. Based on the BYG-1, this new combat system would be improved to meet the requirements of both the Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy, requiring a significant transfer of technology to the United Kingdom. Additionally, interoperability between the RAN and USN submarines is of critical importance to Australia, and thus the AUKUS class would have to be modified to employ standard US weapons, not only heavyweight torpedoes, but land attack and anti-ship cruise missiles as well. To facilitate this, the class will utilize a vertical launch system that will be common amongst the three navies. This will mean that not only will Australian SSNs be highly interoperable with the USN, but so will the Royal Navies. Apparently, the inclusion of US technology in the class is not only limited to the CDS and weapons, but will include the propulsion system and various other components. It is hard to overstate the kind of capability the AUKUS class represents for Australia. To say that it will be a world-class nuclear submarine is probably a significant understatement. In terms of size, it will probably displace around 9,000 tons. It will be an exceptionally stealthy SSN, with a very low passive signature and a high level of resistance to active sonar systems. Complementing its stealth are its sensors, which will be a development of a suite which is already world-leading. It will employ a deadly array of weapons, from the Mark 48 heavyweight torpedo to the Tomahawk Block 5 land attack and anti-ship cruise missile. Eventually, it will probably field an Australian hypersonic cruise missile. These various systems will be linked together with an exceptionally capable combat data system based on the BYG-1. The combination of the PWR-3, a turboelectric drive, and a high-performance pump jet will probably propel the AUKUS class at speeds well in excess of 30 knots which can be sustained indefinitely, giving the submarine a level of kinematic performance Collins-class captains can currently only dream of. 
In combination, these capabilities will make the Orcus class a truly deadly opponent for enemy submarines or warships. Indeed, it will probably possess a decisive technological lead over Eastern Bloc SSNs for decades, which are already technologically inferior to current-gen Western boats. Not only will the submarine be able to circumnavigate the Earth while submerged, its speed will allow it to traverse immense distances quickly, greatly increasing its level of strategic and operational mobility. Even when based in southern Australia, areas which enjoy the protection of strategic depth, these vessels will be able to rapidly reach patrol areas as far away as the North Pacific and Arabian Seas. Furthermore, they will be able to complete entire patrols whilst remaining deep, keeping them hidden from the prying eye of space-based surveillance systems. When armed with deadly land attack cruise missiles, such as the 1000 nautical mile range Tomahawk, the stealthy Orcus class will be able to approach hostile shores across ocean basins. It thus represents an intercontinental power projection capability, holding enemy assets at risk across hemispheres. This combination of range, mobility, stealth, and lethality will allow the RAN to pose a deadly threat to enemy shipping across a vast area of maritime geography, threatening enemy sea lines of communication as far away as the Persian Gulf. Make no mistake about it, an eight-strong force of these submarines is a capability of such significance it alone will make Australia one of the 21st century's major naval powers. That is, by any measure, a revolutionary capability investment. But it's not just the capability the AUKUS class represents that is a profound change in both Australia's military potential and its place in the world, but also the revitalised relationship with the United Kingdom. Throughout the early 20th century, Britain was Australia's primary security partner and ally. London and Canberra were exceptionally close. So much so that during the post-Great War arms control agreements, such as the Washington Naval Treaty, the Royal Australian Navy was considered synonymous with the Royal Navy. However, this relationship was fundamentally altered by the Second World War and the profound change in Britain's place within the global order. Given the dramatic shift in global power caused by the war, especially in the Indo-Pacific, and the extremely close relationship that was forged between Australia and the United States during the war with Japan, Washington replaced London as Canberra's primary ally and strategic partner, a state of affairs that persists to this day. Nonetheless, and despite the primacy of the United States in the Pacific, Australia and the United Kingdom retained their very close strategic relationship throughout the 1950s and 1960s, jointly conducting military campaigns in Malaysia throughout the Malayan Emergency and Confrontasi. In reality, it was the end of Britain as a global power more a path chosen in London as opposed to a situation forced upon it that effectively ended the Anglo-Australian alliance and strategic partnership. The purpose of post-war British policy was, in the words of senior civil servant Sir William Armstrong, the orderly management of decline. This defeatist attitude was undeniably a symptom of the rapid change in Britain's global position, primarily driven by the strategic ascendancy of the United States. This painful period probably represents a kind of repressed national trauma that, perhaps, Britons are still coming to terms with. In many ways, the 1950s and 1960s were defined by a wave of decolonization and the newly won independence of states across the globe, which marked the end of France and Britain as truly great imperial powers. Nonetheless, although it certainly was the nation it had been 20 years before, British military presence in Malaya and Singapore, the cornerstone of its relationship with the Antipodes, gave it a real claim to still being a significant global power. This all ended in the late 1960s, however. In January 1968, the Labour government of Harold Wilson announced that Britain would be withdrawing from all military commitments east of Aden. This meant removing a very significant military presence from the Middle East, Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia. As an example of Britain's military commitment to Malaysia, during the Malayan emergency, there were over 70,000 British troops deployed, supported by some 80 warships. Within just three years, Britain was all but gone from Asia, essentially leaving the defence of newly independent Malaysia to Australia and New Zealand, and effectively ending the Anglo-Australian strategic partnership overnight. This dramatic change in Australia's strategic relationship with the UK was quickly followed by an equally profound shift in the economic relationship between the two nations. Throughout most of Australia's history, Britain had been its primary trading partner, accounting for 80% of the continent's exports in the 1880s. Whilst by the 1970s, the UK had been overtaken by the United States and Japan as an Australian export destination, Canberra and London still enjoyed a preferential economic relationship. Although its economic impact has been questioned, 
Australia and the United Kingdom had provided each other with a set of privileged tariff reductions, a system called imperial preference. This allowed Australian goods to enjoy a competitive advantage in the United Kingdom, in addition to privileged access to capital markets. Although some of the tariff reduction was degraded in 1947, as part of the Stirling Bloc, Australia's favoured access to the British economy persisted well into the 1960s. But this economic relationship was also coming to a rapid close. From 1961, London had been attempting to join the European Economic Community, the predecessor of the European Union, but this was incompatible with any policy of imperial preference. Thus, by 1973, just two years after Britain's withdrawal from Malaya, Australia had not only lost its privileged economic status, it was now subject to the European Economic Community's common external tariff. Although Australia simply accepted its new economic and strategic reality, perhaps a vital but painful episode in the nation's coming of age, none of these developments were necessarily welcomed in Canberra. Despite the fact that Australia's strategic future lay with the United States and its economic future in Asia, these rapid developments certainly had a profound psychological impact in the antipodes. In a single decade, the Anglo-Australian relationship, something that most Australians had seen as foundational to their own national character just 20 years before, was, for all intents and purposes, gone. Over the next half century, ties of sentimentality, kinship, culture and personal connections certainly remained, but in the cold hard currency of geopolitics, London and Canberra were simply worlds apart. With the exception of their continued participation in the Five Eyes community, one could not even call the two nations allies, at least not in any meaningful way. Britain now considered itself an expressly European power. Gone were the great audacious class fleet carriers adorned with phantoms and buccaneers, the ultimate tools of global power projection to be replaced by the helicopter carrier and the Harrier, platforms which were optimised for sea line of communication defence in the North Atlantic. During the same period, the Australian military would adopt the Defence of Australia Doctrine, which would optimise the ADF for operations in and around the Australian continent itself. In the early 21st century, British and Australian forces would serve alongside one another in both Afghanistan and Iraq, but this was driven by their respective relationships with Washington and common strategic outlook, rather than any alliance between one another. Given this strategic backdrop, and a half-century of atrophy in the Anglo-Australian strategic relationship, all driven by Britain's wholesale retreat from the Indo-Pacific and withdrawal from its position as a truly global power, the AUKUS agreement came as a strategic thunderclap. In essence, it is the United Kingdom, rather than the United States, Australia's treaty ally and primary security partner, that is providing most of the technology expertise, and even reactors to the RAN. Australia and the United Kingdom will quite literally be building exactly the same submarine across two shipyards, Osborne in South Australia and Barrow in Furness in Northern England, both operated by BAE Systems. Rolls-Royce will provide the PWR3 reactor for both shipyards. This will be a joint build, meaning that elements of both nations' submarines will quite likely be produced in the other's shipyards and supported by the wider supply chain in both countries, meaning components and even large blocks will be built in one and shipped to the other for assembly. This will likely mean Australian manufactured sections will be included in British submarines, as allowing each shipyard and nation to specialise in areas of comparative advantage will increase the overall efficiency of the program and reduce costs for both nations. All of this will mean the close integration of the Australian and British military industrial bases, combined with the massive transfer of extremely sensitive nuclear and submarine technology from the UK to Australia, including the sale of highly enriched uranium, this represents an extreme level of trust and a very close strategic and industrial relationship, one that will persist throughout the 21st century. Although not formally treaty allies, at least in the traditional sense, Strategically and militarily, the AUKUS agreement now means London and Canberra are joined at the hip. Even during the early 20th century, when Australia was still a British dominion, arguably there was not this level of cooperation and integration between the two powers. Australia was very much the junior partner during the World Wars. As an example, in 1914, Australia's population and GDP were roughly 10% that of the United Kingdom, which rose to around 15% in 1939. But in the 21st century, Australia is a very different country. No longer simply a minor nation, Australia is a globally significant economic and military power, with a GDP and military budget that are approaching the top 10. 
By the end of this decade, Australia's population will be nearly 50% that of the United Kingdom, and in nominal terms, its economy is already more than half as large. Consequently, the 21st century Anglo-Australian partnership is one that is much more a relationship between equals. Obviously, in terms of the technology, Australia is still a junior partner, but the scale of investment is absolutely comparable. In fact, if the UK replaces the Astutes on a one-for-one -one basis, Australia will have the larger SSN fleet. To put this investment into perspective, given how technologically advanced the AUKUS-class SSN is, when operating in coalition, the Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy will probably possess the third or fourth most potent attack submarine force in the world. One should not underestimate just how difficult an endeavour this will be for Australia. Actually manufacturing and sustaining a large SSN fleet is no easy thing, especially for a nation with no experience in military nuclear technology. But with the close partnership with the United Kingdom, including a joint and concurrent build program, the program risk Australia faces can be greatly mitigated. And in Canberra, Britain has found a partner that has the wealth and industrial capability to meaningfully contribute. Construction of the class is set to begin by the end of this decade in both shipyards. The first submarine will probably be delivered to the Royal Navy in the 2030s, with the first Australian boat received a few years later in the early 2040s. Assuming the first Australian submarine is completed in 2042, we should expect the delivery of a new boat approximately every three years, with the last of class hitting the water in 2066. At that point, construction of the next generation of SSN can commence. Typically, building the first vessel in a new class of SSN takes much longer than later units, often up to a decade. That would allow for the retirement of the first AUKUS class submarine in 2075, giving the RAN 33 years of service life. This fleet's size and manufacturing tempo will allow for a continuous build program, a core feature of any sustainable naval shipbuilding industry. Building a nuclear submarine in Australia will require a massive level of investment in the nation's military industrial base, an increasing capability that will serve as the foundation for Australian security and maritime power throughout the century. For example, the Osborne facility will need to be greatly expanded. The shipyard will need to be three times the size that was planned for the attack class, creating over 10,000 jobs in the process. But this is about much more than economic benefits and employment opportunities. As the Ukraine war has hopefully demonstrated, a capable military industrial base is a key strategic asset. In any large regional conflict, Australia cannot hope to rely on other nations to supply it with the arms it may well need to defend itself. The collective West is struggling to sustain the Ukrainian war effort, even whilst we are at peace. Simply having someone else build our submarines or warships because it is cheaper is a true luxury of a benign strategic environment, one Australia can simply no longer afford. Notably, this increased industrial base will extend to nuclear waste management and decommissioning. One would assume that Australia's first generation of SSN could be simply sent to one of the other AUKUS partners for decommissioning. However, as part of its commitment to responsible nuclear stewardship, the Australian government has stated that it will retain full responsibility for these submarines, including any nuclear waste generated, and will decommission them in Australia. The prospect of handling and storing nuclear waste is, perhaps, one of the most emotive issues surrounding Australia's acquisition of nuclear submarines. Indeed, the problems surrounding nuclear waste are probably one of the most misunderstood and slandered areas of nuclear energy in general. For many people, when they think of nuclear waste, they imagine tons of glowing green goo, often being dumped into pristine lakes by Mr. Burns and his cronies, a satirical caricature that has come to dominate wider public conceptions of the technology. Yes, managing the decommissioning of a nuclear submarine means dealing with some nuclear waste, which needs to be done carefully and responsibly, but the scale of this problem is vastly exaggerated in popular conception. As dangerous and long-lived as high-grade nuclear waste is, it is absolutely tiny in volume. A typical modern marine reactor has a core that is roughly one cubic meter in size. Thus, after 33 years of operation, a single SSN will produce just a few tons of spent fuel, which is the primary component of high-grade waste. Although this requires specialized containers and handling facilities, it is a tiny volume of material. Typically, this is left to cool, allowing the fission products to decay before it is reprocessed. Just as an example of how little waste nuclear reactors produce, 
of all the civilian reactors that generate power in the United States, which has some 93 commercial reactors currently operational and has been producing electricity for over 50 years, none of the waste has left the power plants. There is so little of it, it is simply stored on site. Nuclear reactors also generate a much larger volume of low and intermediate level waste, consisting of miscellaneous things like filters, clothing, rags, and other materials such as reactor cladding and components. This material only poses a moderate level of radiological risk. Generally speaking, as it has been neutron activated, it poses no threat to groundwater contamination and has a reasonably short half-life. It can be safely stored in specialized landfills. All nuclear wastes produced as part of Australia's nuclear submarine program will be stored in defense facilities. As much as nuclear waste is a topic that can generate hysteria in some sections of the public, the reality is Australia has been dealing with domestically produced nuclear waste for decades. The Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization has been operating nuclear reactors in Australia since 1958. Currently, the ANSTO operates a 20 megawatt fission reactor at Lucas Heights, Sydney. The Open Pool Australian Light Water Reactor, or OPAL, has been in nearly continuous operation since 2007. The reactor is a critical neutron source and is used to conduct scientific research, generate specific isotopes for industrial processes, and produce irradiated target materials for medical procedures, like cancer treatment. Although OPAL is much smaller than the PWR3, roughly 10% of the thermal output, it still produces all forms of nuclear waste. Roughly every 35 days of operation, spent fuel assemblies have to be removed from the reactor and replaced. These spent fuel rods contain numerous fission products and transuranic elements, all of which are extremely radioactive and potentially dangerous. In an entirely similar process to Australia's marine reactors, at the end of its life cycle, Opal will have to be decommissioned and the high and intermediate grade waste will have to be stored. Opal's predecessor, HIFAR, which notably also used highly enriched uranium, is currently in the process of being decommissioned, a program that will be completed by 2025. Although much smaller in scale than the nuclear submarine fleet, these reactors have shown Australia's ability to responsibly handle nuclear waste for some 70 years. Hopefully, the scale and ambition of the AUKUS-class program is now becoming apparent. When this submarine ends its service life with the RAN sometime in the 2070s, it will have transformed not only the Royal Australian Navy, but the Australian military industrial complex and wider technological base. Furthermore, the replacement of the AUKUS class may well be powered by an Australian-built nuclear reactor. In fact, the specialist capabilities required to build, sustain, and decommission these submarines could well serve as the technical foundation to a wider Australian nuclear industry. Be it fission or fusion, nuclear energy will almost certainly be a critical element in transitioning to a low-carbon future. But one thing we can be sure of, whether Australia ever develops a civilian nuclear industry, it is in the nuclear submarine business for good. This all sounds very impressive, but there's one major problem. Even under the most optimistic timeline, the first AUKUS-class submarines will be delivered to the RAN in the early 2040s, two decades from now. Even if we produce them as fast as we could, roughly one every two years, it would be 2054 before six were delivered. HMAS Collins was laid down in 1990, launched in 1993, and commissioned in 1996. By 2042, she will be nearly 50 years old. The Collins class was designed with a 30-year life cycle. What happens if the first AUKUS class submarine is delayed, which is hardly unlikely? After all, HMS Astute was only declared operational some 13 years after being laid down. In a program this complex and difficult, we should expect delays. Pushing the Collins this far beyond its design service life not only raises safety concerns, but serious questions about the class's tactical viability. Clearly, an interim submarine capability is desperately required. Here, in an act of real generosity, the United States has agreed to sell Australia the Virginia-class submarine. Although still subject to US congressional approval, the initial agreement, as signed in the AUKUS Treaty, commits the United States to sell three Virginia-class submarines to Australia, with the option for two more. The Virginia-class attack submarine is arguably the most capable currently operational SSN in the world. Fast, stealthy and lethal, the 8,000-ton Virginia is a marvel of naval technology. The submarine is powered by the revolutionary 210-megawatt SG-9 reactor, the most advanced widely used marine reactor in the world. The SG-9 drives a steam turbine propulsion system, which turns a pump jet as opposed to a propeller. 
Originally developed by BAE Systems for the Royal Navy, this pump jet improves overall performance whilst reducing noise by limiting cavitation. Capable of sustaining speeds well in excess of 30 knots indefinitely and able to achieve a depth of over 300 meters, the Virginia enjoys excellent kinematic performance. Blocks 1 to 4 have a payload of 38 weapons. Four 21-inch torpedo tubes with magazine space for an additional 22 torpedoes, mines, or missiles. This is in addition to the vertical launch system, which can fire 12 Tomahawk land attack or anti-ship cruise missiles. In Blocks 1 and 2, this VLS was composed of 12 Tomahawk-sized tubes. But in order to simplify construction and reduce cost, from Block 3 onward, this VLS complex was replaced by two larger launch tubes, which can deploy six missiles each. The much larger Block 5 will be equipped with the Virginia payload module, six of which will enable the submarine to fire an impressive 40 Tomahawk-sized weapons from its vertical launch system, in addition to larger munitions such as ballistic missiles or underwater drones. Designed to replace the Ohio-class SSGN, the impressive land attack capability of the Block 5 Virginias mean they probably deserve the SSGN title as well. For Special Forces insertion, the class is equipped with an integral nine-man diving chamber. Capable of cruising at over 20 knots and remaining submerged for over 90 days, the Virginia is able to conduct lengthy patrols across vast distances, including whole ocean basins. The submarine is also exceptionally stealthy. Although probably not as resistant to passive or active sonar as the next generation AUKUS class, extensive signature reduction techniques have been employed, from the pump jet to the drivetrain to an anechoic coating. This also includes a classified advanced electromagnetic signature reduction technique. Similar to the LPI mode used by advanced AESA fighter control radars, specifically designed algorithms constantly monitor the vessel's electronic emissions, tailoring them to limit its possible detection whilst communicating or using its surface search radar. The Virginia employs a highly capable sensor suite. The sonar complex includes a number of different systems that provide synergistic benefits. At the front of the submarine is the BQQ-10 spherical active passive sonar array, which provides passive sonar information in three dimensions. From Block 3 onward, this highly complex spherical array of air-backed hydrophones was replaced with the water-backed large aperture bow sonar array. This horseshoe-shaped sonar provides a similar capability at a highly reduced cost. Combined with the simplified vertical launch system, the Virginia payload tube, the new bow section reduced the total number of parts by nearly 50%, from 50,000 to 28,000. The bow array is supplemented by a number of other passive and active systems. A pair of high-frequency active sonars on the chin and sail provide 360 degrees of highly accurate, close-range active sonar coverage, a critical capability in a submarine engagement. This is supplemented by the low-cost conformal array, which provides 360 degrees of high-frequency passive coverage, adding to the boat's short-range situational awareness. For long-range detection and tracking, the Virginia is equipped with the highly advanced, low-frequency passive, lightweight wide aperture array. Arranged along the sides of the hull, these large fiber optic arrays are capable of detecting low frequency acoustic energy at very long range. Finally, these hull mounted systems are supplemented by a pair of towed array sonars that combine both high and low frequency active and passive modes. The Virginia is not equipped with a traditional periscope, rather it utilizes a modern photonics mast. This includes a high-resolution digital camera, which operates in both the visible and infrared spectrums, a laser rangefinder, and integrated ESM component. The photonics mask does not penetrate the hull, but rather relays the digitized information via a fiber optic cable, which can then be enhanced. This allows the Virginia to conduct a visual search much faster than a traditional periscope, limiting the submarine's vulnerability to surface and airborne radars. Similar ESM and surface search radar masks are also employed. This vast complex of sensors and weapons is controlled by the AN-BYG-1 combat system, which integrates the sensor suite with the tactical control system and weapon control system. In summation, the Virginia is an immensely impressive submarine. It is probably the most potent off-the-shelf undersea warfighting capability the nation could have possibly acquired. The first will be delivered in 2033, approximately the same time HMAS attack was scheduled for commissioning, then followed by additional boats in 2036 and 2039. If required, the agreement includes an option for an additional two units. This would allow the RAN to possess a highly credible five-boat fleet by the early 2040s if the AUKUS class is delayed. 
Even in the very unlikely event that there is a catastrophic problem with the SSN AUKUS program, the RAN will be able to retire its Collins class fleet at a reasonable date. This deal has many advantages for Australia. By simply buying these boats from the United States, Australia can rapidly acquire a nuclear submarine far more quickly than we could ever build one. It also allows the RAN to gain experience in the operation and maintenance of an SSN as soon as possible, meaning that when the Australian built boats arrive, we will have already amassed a decade of time in the nuclear submarine game. Reportedly, these Virginia class submarines will be a mix of used and newly built boats. And interestingly, according to the US Department of Defense, they will not include the Virginia payload module, which is being included in the current generation block five. The VPM was reportedly omitted at Australia's request. One would assume that the cheaper Virginia payload tube would be used instead, as the older 12 tube VLS adds cost and complexity without any additional capability, but it's still unclear what configuration the Australian Virginias will use. As much as the provision of US manufactured Virginia class submarines is an excellent interim submarine capability, in fact, it is the very best solution available, it does raise some other questions. The first is, if we are going to procure the Virginia class from the United States, why not simply build them or buy them as opposed to the comparatively immature, 70% complete SSN AUKUS design? After all, the Australian military initially stated that they preferred a mature design, and a highly plausible program structure could see the acquisition of two or three used or US-made submarine, followed by a rolling domestic build of Australian-made Virginias. Or, why not just buy eight Virginias from US production lines? There are a few reasons why these aren't really viable, or at least optimal, options. The first is the fact that Australia will be building its submarines for decades. If you are going to sustain any naval shipbuilding enterprise, you need a continuous shipbuilding program. A stop-start tempo of procurement will leave your shipyards empty for years at a time, which leads to the loss of the highly skilled workforce that is the beating heart of any well-functioning naval industry. All of the major naval powers have continuous shipbuilding programs. This Australian nuclear submarine will be in continuous production for over four decades. Plus, it takes years to build one of these exquisitely complex machines. The problem here is the United States is planning to end Virginia production well before the Australian run would have completed. Acquisition will finish in 2043. Thus, when Australia had only built the first of its submarines, the US would begin construction of a new class, meaning the wider supply chain as a whole would stop making critical components for the Virginia. For example, GE would cease SG-9 reactor production. Now, Australia could pay for this to continue, but as the sole customer, the cost would be substantial. Essentially, the economy of scale and risk mitigation that is provided by a joint build program would be lost. With a technology as complex as this, and with such a heavy reliance upon foreign suppliers, the last thing Australia wants is to be left building these submarines alone. In the UK, Australia has a partner whose requirements and capabilities are much more aligned with its own. The Royal Navy and Royal Australian Navy will have similar sized fleets, will be building submarines at the same time, and will have a similar production run. Additionally, just given the relative size of the investments being made, Australia has much more influence on the design of the AUKUS class. It is a true partner, as opposed to simply a customer. There are a number of reasons why simply buying Virginias directly off US production lines was also not a viable option. Firstly, it's quite clear that the US industrial base could simply not accommodate eight additional boats. Even the very limited purchase of three Virginias, some of them used, generated significant pushback from US Congress. Currently, US shipyards are struggling to meet the demands of the US Navy, especially as construction of the Columbia class SSBN has commenced. For example, the two shipyards that make SSNs, General Dynamics Electric Boatyard in Connecticut and Newport News in Virginia, are delivering, on average, 1.2 boats per year. The target of two deliveries per year will probably not be reached until 2028. In return for the very limited purchase of three units, some of them used, Australia had to significantly contribute to the US industrial base. This reportedly includes a $1 billion investment in US shipyards. Additionally, USN submarines will be able to use Australian facilities to conduct major maintenance. This is actually a more critical bottleneck than submarine production and having access to additional facilities in Adelaide and Perth will have a meaningful impact on US SSN availability. 
But even if buying a full run of Virginia class submarines from the US yards was actually possible, there are several reasons why the Australian government and military prefers a domestic build. The most obvious and most maligned is the real economic benefits of domestic production. Building these submarines in Australia will create tens of thousands of jobs, stimulating economic growth for decades, increasing Australia's GDP and, thus, the federal and state government's aggregate tax revenue. Many of these jobs will be highly skilled, requiring a massive upskilling in areas such as nuclear engineering, which will then improve the nation's technical base as a whole. It will drive innovation, technological development and education throughout the nation. Myopic complaints about satisfying union jobs simply fail to see the greater positive impact of a national endeavour on this scale. How many more scientists and engineers will this nation possess as a direct result of this program? How much larger will our universities be? How many highly experienced shipbuilders will migrate here? This really is the Australian equivalent of the Apollo program. Plus, there is the more basic principle that if Australia is going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars on defence, paying someone to build our submarines, those funds should, as much as possible, be spent in Australia. This additional investment will reverberate throughout the economy via the multiplier effect. If we pay someone else to do it, all of these benefits will be lost. The money will simply be gone. It will be a drain on our GDP and a boost to someone else's. This needs to be remembered, even if a domestic build program is more expensive. But there are many operational and strategic reasons why Australia should pursue a domestic build. Submarines are uniquely maintenance-intensive platforms. The requirement for safety in the punishing underwater environment means that a typical submarine will spend, on average, a third of its life in dry dock. For example, the Oberon class had to undergo a major refit every five years, which involved a nearly complete stripping of the hull. This process consumed 1.25 million man-hours of labour and took over two years to complete. The first refit of HMAS Onslow cost a whopping 75% of the purchase price. That's akin to an F-35 costing $75 million simply to maintain over a five-year period. The Collins class currently undergoes a six-year operational cycle. Every four years, the boat is brought in for full-cycle docking, a process that typically takes up to two years. During this period, the Collins is stripped, the hull cut open, the diesel engines and main motor are removed, and a very large number of parts are replaced or refurbished. This is nothing like a tank, a fighter, or even a destroyer. Essentially, the submarine has to be partially rebuilt every six years. As you can imagine, the parts consumption is absolutely enormous. If Australia has purchased the submarine from a foreign shipyard, then, by definition, it is relying on a foreign supply chain. As Australia experienced with the Oberon class, this can have a crushing impact on submarine availability. Relying on imports for the countless small parts drove up costs and imposed delays. And as Australia did not own the intellectual property for the Oberon class, it struggled to mitigate this problem by shifting to domestic supply. All of these problems are solved by a domestic build. If you build the submarine here, then, by definition, you not only have the domestic supply chain which can provide through-life support, but you own all of the intellectual property. Thus, a domestic build is much better in ensuring submarine force availability, a very solid operational rationale. After all, it doesn't matter how many submarines you own if they are all sitting in dry dock waiting for parts. Obviously, large elements of the AUKUS class will be built in the United Kingdom, but these are not, generally speaking, maintenance intensive. The core of the PWR-3 reactor, as an example, does not need to be opened until the boat is decommissioned. So, building these boats in Australia, even if the reactors are imported, ensures that the reliance upon foreign parts suppliers is minimised. Finally, when it comes to the nation's defence, the Australian government aims to achieve as much self-reliance as possible. This is a righteous and wholly sound aspiration for a significant economic, military and geopolitical power like Australia. Many comparable nations, with similar economies and similar militaries, have a much greater domestic design and manufacturing capacity. South Korea, Japan, and even comparable European powers like Italy and Spain are not only capable of building their own warships, but designing them. Ultimately, Australia should aspire to be able to design and build its own SSNs and other warships, potentially with domestically manufactured reactors, which are perfectly suited to Australian requirements. 
By partnering with the United Kingdom in the SSN AUKUS program and building these submarines in Australia, the nation is embarking upon just such a path. By the last quarter of this century, a wholly domestic Australian SSN is certainly not unthinkable. In summation, even if the US had the spare capacity to build Australia's whole SSN fleet, which it simply doesn't, a domestic build would still be preferable, even if it means a higher upfront cost. There are other interesting consequences of adopting the Virginia class as an interim submarine capability. Exactly how long we will be operating these boats is still unclear. The initial statement made regarding the purchase of US submarines indicated that these would be used boats. On its face, this is a wholly reasonable option. The main challenge in the cancellation of the attack class was the 10 or so years of delay this would impose on submarine construction, pushing the in-service date back from the early 2030s to the early 2040s. Barring some catastrophic problem, there should be six AUKUS-class submarines available by the mid to late 2050s, with the full run of eight complete by 2066 or thereabouts. The major challenge is mitigating the gap between the retirement of the Collins class in the late 2030s and 2040s and having enough AUKUS class boats in the water to replace them. The Virginia class has a service life of 33 years, which is actually more than we need to bridge this capability gap. Thus, acquiring boats that are, say, 10 years old would actually fit this requirement perfectly. For example, the Block 4 USS Utah which is currently under construction and should enter service in 2025, will be eight years old in 2033. She would give the RAN some 25 years of operational service, being ready for decommissioning in 2058, by which time AUKUS class production should be well underway. However, Australia will also be acquiring newly built units. This raises some interesting force structure implications. Let's imagine that units two and three are new production submarines, presumably block fours, which are delivered in 2036 and 2039, respectively. Under this arrangement, unless they are sold back to the United States, which is unlikely, these submarines will be in service with the RAN until 2069 and 2072. The eight-unit production run should be complete by the mid-2060s, and the first AUKUS class should be ready for decommissioning in 2075. New production submarines mean two things. Firstly, Australia will operate a mixed force of Virginia and AUKUS class SSNs throughout their service lives. Thus, in actuality, the Virginia is no interim submarine capability. It will be a core part of the RAN submarine force for some four decades. Secondly, Australia will probably end up with more than eight SSNs. Assuming a three-year production drumbeat with three Virginia-class SSNs, the RAN will achieve a six-boat force in 2048, an eight-boat force in 2054, and a 10-boat force in 2060. Considering each Virginia will probably cost the Australian taxpayer around $5 billion, the government will want to reap the maximum return on that investment, which means a full 33 years of service life. Therefore, the Aussie Virginia will be with us for a very long time. As much as the introduction of the Virginia class is a game-changing capability for Australia, we still have to wait a decade before we see one flying the white ensign. This will do nothing to mitigate the very dangerous strategic environment Australia faces in the 2020s. In order to significantly increase the naval capability based in Australia, and to provide the Royal Australian Navy with hands-on experience in basing, maintaining and operating nuclear submarines, both the United Kingdom and the United States will rotate a large number of SSNs through Australia. Called Submarine Rotational Force West, this will include the semi-permanent basing of one British and up to four US nuclear submarines in Fleet Base West, HMA Stirling, located on Garden Island, Perth. Whilst at Fleet Base West, Australian submariners will embed with their British and American counterparts, and these vessels will conduct extensive training with the Royal Australian Navy and ADF Rich Large. Although this will be a rotational force, and neither British or American submarines will be technically based in Australia, from 2027, there will still be a very substantial force of allied SSNs on the continent. Obviously, this will be a vital opportunity for training, but it will also mean in the eventuality of any military conflict in the region, there will be up to 11 submarines in Australia, including five state-of-the-art SSNs. The significant implications for Australian security and the regional posture of the alliance as a whole should be obvious. This leads us to the last piece of the ADF submarine force puzzle, the Collins class. Perhaps the most maligned project in Australian military history, the Collins remains a core component of Australia's high-end warfighting capability. 
Australia's first domestically produced submarine, Collins had a troubled childhood and adolescence. Delivered late, over budget and with numerous teething problems, including high-speed noise, the class gained a popular reputation as a troubled program. This was only magnified by an exceptionally poor run of operational availability. At times, during its first 10 years of service, availability was so poor that out of the six boats, only one was ready for deployment. As noted by Dr. John Coles, this was far below international benchmarks of submarine program performance. It took the wholesale reform of the Australian submarine industry to address these problems, but by the mid-2010s, the Collins class was providing availability and reliability that was exceeding the Navy's expectations. Despite the now excellent performance of the class, much like the F-35, it has never lived down the reputation it earned in its adolescence. The Collins class was never intended to operate into the 2040s. HMAS Collins was laid down in February 1990, some 33 years ago. She was originally intended to retire in 2026. This would be followed by her sisters, with one boat retiring every two years. HMAS Rankin would finally end her service in 2038, 35 years after commissioning. But just as Collins was treated unfairly by the Australian press and public, so was it neglected by the political class. Despite the immediate need to begin work on its successor, Numerous governments simply preferred to kick the can down the road, leaving these hard choices to their successors. It was only in 2015, six years after the capability requirement was initially outlined, that the Collins replacement was taken seriously. This lost time could not be made good, and when the short fin Barracuda Block 1A was selected, severe pressure on the Collins life cycle was already steadily accumulating. Even as late as 2021, construction on HMAS attack had not yet begun. And even under the most optimistic timeline, HMAS Collins would have to serve into the mid-2030s. The cancellation of the attack class in 2021 only made this problem worse. Now an additional six years had been wasted, and some 12 years after the 2009 Defence White Paper, Australia did not even have a preferred design for its next generation submarine. Although, perhaps, this is an easier thing to say than to do, This utter mess could have simply been avoided if Australia had simply selected a nuclear submarine in the early 2010s, as several military experts were advocating at the time. Indeed, the Obama administration did offer the Virginia-class submarine to Australia, at least informally. Obviously, the political climate was simply not conducive to breaking the supposed nuclear taboo, and the wider recognition of the strategic danger Australia faces amongst the general public in the 2020s may have made this transition more possible. But, notwithstanding these constraints, this debacle is crystalline evidence of the short-term strategic planning, force structure reform, and approach to platform acquisition that has plagued the Australian military throughout the 21st century. A little bit of forethought and some political courage a decade ago could well have avoided this mess completely. Thus, it was clear that the delays in even selecting a replacement submarine meant that Collins would have to serve on well beyond its initial retirement date. Now, with the construction of an Australian nuclear submarine adding a decade to this already bloated time frame, the Collins class would have to soldier on until the middle of this century. But there were initial concerns as to whether this was even possible. Submarines are not like typical warships. As part of normal operations, they are subjected to immense pressure and a punishing undersea environment. The constant changing of depth subjects the hull to enormous pressure differentials, and at an operational depth of 300 metres, or 1,000 feet, the vessel has to withstand a pressure of 30 atmospheres, or 441 psi. As an example of how tough this can be on a submarine, the Japanese only expect a 20-year life from their boats. Ultimately, there is no point in upgrading or extending the Collins class if the steel the boats are made of are not capable of sustaining another 10 years of abuse. No submarine can remain operational forever. A testament to the quality of the Collins original construction and the steel used, after inspection of the hull steel, it was determined that the old girl could remain operational for an additional decade of service life. Surely a lucky outcome. But what kind of submarine would an upgraded Collins be? Would it even be tactically competitive and a realistically viable platform in 2045? Collins has the same inherent limitations as all diesel electric submarines limited submerged endurance and vulnerability to hold down, the need to regularly snorkel and run her noisy diesel generators leading to unstealthy periods of indiscretion, comparatively poor kinematic performance, providing inferior tactical and operational mobility, 
relatively limited hotel electric power, which inhibits sensor, drone, and combat system performance, and a relatively limited weapons capacity. But, as far as conventional submarines go, Collins has many inherent virtues. The design, at its very core, is a good one. Firstly, the Collins is a stealthy attack submarine. Not only is the class fitted with features designed to reduce its passive acoustic signature, such as acoustically isolating the decks from the hull and the use of vibration absorbent fittings, electric propulsion is inherently quiet. Therefore, when moving at a patrol quiet speed of three knots, the Collins has been measured to emit less sound than the background ocean noise. It is also a large diesel electric submarine. In fact, Collins is still amongst the largest in the world. This provides it with several inherent advantages. Firstly, it has a very long patrol range with a 90-day endurance. Collins can remain on station for seven weeks at a range of some 2,500 nautical miles from base. This means it can routinely operate in areas as far away as the South China Sea. The second major benefit of its size is its submerged endurance and indiscretion rate. Collins's large battery bank means it can stay submerged for very long periods without needing to run its noisy diesel generators at the surface. Then, when it does need to snorkel, its 4.2 megawatts worth of diesel generation capacity means it can rapidly recharge its batteries. Even when steaming at full speed, Collins can fully recharge her batteries from depletion in just one hour. But, when she is being frugal, moving slowly and conserving energy, as would be typical when in a patrol area, the submarine only needs to snorkel for a few minutes every 24 hours. In combination, its large battery bank and massive diesel generators give the Collins such a low rate of indiscretion that, despite substantial testing, air-independent propulsion technologies have not been utilized on the class. The submerged performance is already so good that the penalties one pays in internal volume, and thus range, were simply not deemed to be worth it. Collins also has a relatively large weapons payload, with six torpedo tubes and magazine space for an additional 16 weapons. Finally, the relatively large size and hotel electric capacity, at least for a conventional submarine, allow the Collins class to employ a large and powerful sensor suite and advanced combat system. Despite being 30 years old, these inherent virtues still make the Collins a highly competitive attack submarine. Clearly, in order to remain competitive, not just into the 2020s, but through the 2040s, the Collins class had to go through a significant upgrade program. Many of the critical components and systems of the submarine are now decades old. As early as the mid-2010s, a large-scale upgrade to the Collins class was being advocated, primarily as a risk mitigation feature if the attack class program fell behind schedule or underperformed. But this is no mere upgrade. Awkwardly named the Life of Type Extension Program, what is being proposed for the Collins class is essentially a complete rebuild of the submarine. Almost every major component in the boat will either be replaced or upgraded. This refit is so significant and substantial that one could argue that the LOTE Collins deserve the Block 2 label. They will essentially be brand new submarines. As stated previously, the Collins class undergoes a six-year sustainment cycle. Every four years, two boats are hauled onto land and stripped, a process called full cycle docking. The LOTE upgrade program will begin in 2026 as part of the usual full cycle docking schedule. HMAS Farncombe will be the first boat to undergo this upgrade, which will be conducted simultaneously with the typical maintenance program. She will rejoin the fleet sometime in 2028. The current plan would entertain a single boat undergoing this upgrade at a time, with the second commencing in 2028, the third in 2030 and so on. The final vessel, HMAS Rankin, will complete this process in 2038. The LOTE program is designed to give the Collins class 10 years of service life, meaning these upgraded boats will be withdrawn from service from 2038 to 2050, at which point the Collins class will have been operational with the RAN for over half a century. Thus, in 2045 or so, the RAN will be operating three classes of submarine, Collins, Orcus, and Virginia. Although $6 billion has already been allocated, the total cost of the program could be in excess of $10 billion. One of the foundational premises of the Collins Life of Type Extension program is that the sensors and other systems that are specified should, to the greatest extent possible, be common with the attack class. After all, there is no point spending years determining what the best available sonar or propulsion systems are, only to then repeat that process for Collins. Thus, although the upgraded LOTE Collins boats will be smaller, less stealthy, slower, and have an inferior payload, they will deploy many of the same systems and capabilities as their stillborn successor. The foundation of this upgrade will be the core systems of the submarine. 
The Swedish Hedemora diesel engines will be replaced with the far more modern 3120 kilowatt German MTU 4000 series. This will provide increased electricity generation capacity and improved efficiency and reliability. The power distribution system will be replaced by a far newer model produced by German firm Euroatlas, which will link the new generators to a brand new permanent magnet AC motor developed by Jumont and Schneider. Many of these systems were to be used on the attack class. The periscope will be replaced by a fully digital photonics mast provided by French company Safran, which was again to be featured on attack. The sonar suite will also receive significant improvements, including the Heron mine and obstacle avoidance system and a new high frequency intercept array. These will be supplemented by a new wideband satellite communication system and significant improvements to the combat system. These upgrades are all included in the finalized and approved package A. Package B is still being studied and probably includes some of the more ambitious capability options. Rear Admiral Peter Quinn stated that the RAN is currently studying the possibility of integrating the Tomahawk land attack cruise missile on the Collins. Although the inclusion of a specialized VLS is not unthinkable, by far the most straightforward and cost-effective way of achieving this is to employ the tube-launched variant, which is fired like a typical torpedo. Considering the reasonably large weapons load, swapping six or eight torpedoes for Tomahawks would not fatally compromise the Collins' ability to conduct anti-surface or anti-submarine warfare, and therefore the ability to defend itself. The combat system would require some minor upgrades, and the changes to weapon handling and storage would be minimal. The Block 5 Tomahawk would not only give the Collins a 1,000 nautical mile land attack capability, it also has an anti-shipping variant. Given the probability that the UGM-84 sub-launched Harpoon will be significantly inferior to the anti-shipping Tomahawk, especially in terms of range, integrating the Tomahawk could kill two birds with one stone. Although absolutely inferior to a Virginia in this role, Collins' stealth and long range certainly make her a viable land attack platform. This could rapidly give Australia an intercontinental strike capability, albeit one that is reasonably limited in scale. The only problem with Tomahawk is the tube-launched variant is not currently in production. Restarting the production line is not impossible, but it may increase cost. We are left to speculate as to what other elements could be included in Package B, but integrated unmanned underwater vehicles and other advanced capabilities are probably top of the list. As stated earlier, AIP has been ruled out of the program. Obviously, these upgrades will not change what Collins is fundamentally. It will still have the same weaknesses as all diesel electric submarines, vulnerabilities that will be all the more exposed by advances in space-based ocean surveillance systems and increasing threat ASW capability, especially in the heavily defended waters of East Asia. Nonetheless, these new Collins will remain some of the most capable conventional submarines in operation anywhere. They will still be able to meet Australia's unique range requirements, and they will do so with the same stealth and persistence. With a heavy payload of lethal Mark 48 Mod 7 heavyweight torpedoes, the quiet Collins will still pose a deadly threat to enemy task forces. Furthermore, many of the capabilities envisaged for the attack class will be realized on its predecessor. Thus, through the life of type extension program, those who always wanted to build a son of Collins will get their wish. These will essentially be brand new boats that will just share the same hull. The course the nation has now embarked upon will undeniably make it one of the 21st century's major maritime powers. By 2050, with a fleet of six to eight world-leading and extremely potent nuclear attack submarines, a mix of Virginia and AUKUS classes, the RAN will rank clearly amongst the top 10 in the world. In terms of conventional undersea warfighting capability, it may be closer to the top five, on par with the United Kingdom and potentially superior to major maritime powers such as France and Japan. It will provide Australia with the kind of strategic heft it has never had, allowing the Australian military to project meaningful power across ocean basins and hold enemy assets at risk at intercontinental distances. Given the immense challenges the nation faces over the coming decades, as it tries to not only ensure its own security but maintain a regional order that is congruent with the prosperity of all Indo-Pacific nations, not just the strong, this is a righteous and worthy aspiration for the Australian military and people. Nonetheless, it remains to be seen if this will be enough to weather the coming storm, if it ever indeed hits. What will the Chinese military look like in 2050? How many SSNs will it field? How many supercarriers? 
What kind of threat environment will we face then? Ultimately, much will depend upon the future of the Chinese economy, demography, and political society. But one thing is certain, we need to take countermeasures now. In fact, as much as the AUKUS agreement is absolutely the right path for Australia, we needed to make these decisions a decade ago. The story of Australia's next generation submarine is, in essence, a debacle. Had the political class heeded the warnings of the Australian strategic community in 2010, or indeed 2015, and simply had the courage to break the nuclear taboo then, we may have been receiving our first Virginia-class SSN in 2023, as opposed to 2033. Let's hope history does not punish us for these very short-sighted decisions, and the decade of the 2020s is remembered as an uneventful one.